Dr. Ellsmere, thank you so much for coming, and uh, please start your program. Good morning. Certainly a pleasure to do the, uh, the video conference uh, uh, this, this morning, uh, Surgical Innovation. So we're going to talk about minimally invasive management of pancreatic pseudocysts. And it's uh, certainly over the last decade, we've seen pseudocysts increasingly being managed endoscopically. As far as uh, diagnosing and characterizing uh, these uh, pseudocysts, it's most often done with CT. CT is often used for assessing these outcomes as well, but there is also clearly a role for MR as well as transabdominal ultrasound and uh, uh, endoscopic ultrasound. There are several acceptable techniques to effectively drain uh, symptomatic uh, pseudocysts ranging from uh, surgery to percutaneous to endoscopic. Most of today's discussion will talk about endoscopic. Um, it's been uh, my observation that the care pathways at the various centers tend to reflect the uh, local expertise that is available there. The uh, objectives for the, uh, the talk is to talk about uh, the management of pseudocysts, uh, review the efficacy of endoscopic drainage, um, talk about several of the controversies around the uh, technique of endoscopic uh, drainage, and lastly, talk about uh, how we uh, manage the complications that, it, that can occur when you approach these uh, problems endoscopically. We'll start off with a case, which is a, a pancreatic cyst gastrostomy. It's the 42-year-old gentleman with a long history of alcohol abuse who was admitted with nausea, vomiting, severe abdominal pain, and a fever, and is often the case in these uh, case discussions. Uh, he's kind of a classic patient. He's got symptoms of uh, gastric outlet obstruction, so the nausea and the vomiting. He also has uh, pain and, and fever, and, and sometimes you see patients with pain, uh, infection, or other times they just have the, the nausea and the vomiting. But here's the, uh, the CAT scan that shows that this gentleman has uh, chronic pancreatitis, as well as a large uh, pseudocyst in the body of his pancreas. And endoscopically, what you can appreciate is that he has a uh, very uh, pronounced uh, bulge in the uh, uh, and the posterior wall of the stomach. And so in this particular setting, the endoscopist has, has chose to proceed with doing the gastrotomy using a needle knife. It's just a monopolar cautery, you can see there. And then uh, following the, uh, the gastrotomy, a guide wire is placed into the pseudocyst, and that uh, guide wire is subsequently followed by a dilatation balloon, and that uh, gastrotomy is dilated uh, in uh, up to 15 millimeters. Some people even do larger. In my practice, I tend to do a 15 millimeter dilatation. Uh, subsequent to that dilatation, what you classically see is the pouring out of uh, the, uh, the pseudocyst contest. In this case, you can clearly see that this uh, gentleman has a purulent discharge and infected pseudocyst is consistent with the diagnosis. You can get a fair amount of fluid, and so at this point in the, in the intervention, what you oftentimes have to do is to deal with that fluid endoscopically and suck up that fluid uh, before proceeding to the next step. And the next step is uh, to uh, place uh, stents. Um, and uh, the number of stents varies in the literature. Most people are under the feeling that the more stents you place, the less likelihood are you of developing infection down the road. Uh, it's my practice, actually. I usually tend to put in one stent. And if uh, infections occur, then I deal with that later. And we'll talk about that uh, um, uh, uh, later in the conversation. Say, James. So any uh, discussion James. on the uh, Pancreatic pseudocyst has to start off with a, a definition. Uh, there are a number of definitions out there, but this is a fairly workable definition for the context of this discussion, which pancreatic pseudocyst is a collection of amylase-rich fluid encased by re reactive granulation tissue in around the pancreas, secondary to pancreatitis or ductal leakage. Now, that could be single or multiple. It could be small or large. Large is often thought of as greater than six centimeters, and most of these communicate with the pancreatic ductal system. When uh, you're evaluating uh, uh, someone for a pancreatic pseudocyst, the, um, the first thing you want to entertain is the, uh, the alternative diagnosis. Is this, uh, is this, in fact, not a pseudocyst, but in fact a, a neoplastic cyst? And so uh, many times that can be uh, done with a CT scan. Of course, the important thing here is the history. That you want to have somebody who's had a, an episode of pancreatitis or has chronic pancreatitis uh, uh, in the context of the diagnosis. Uh, and if there's any question uh, following that on the CT scan, then uh, oftentimes an MRR can be very helpful. And then if there still remains a question, then it's reasonable to proceed with an endoscopic ultrasound to help differentiate. The other issue you want to appreciate is that the maturity of the wall of that pseudocyst. Uh, 
you don't want to uh, take on a pseudocyst where the wall is immature because it's certainly a uh, risk of uh, perforating the, the pseudocyst itself. And so in my practice, I tend to uh, wait. Uh, I like to get them out to about five to six weeks uh, if they're having symptoms uh, before I tackle that. But that, that varies uh, in the literature. And as far as uh, uh, pancreatic necrosis, uh, you can have a pseudocyst that's got some debris in it that uh, typically is a result of uh, earlier uh, necrosis. Uh, it's important to appreciate up front because what we know in these particular patients is they're the ones that have a higher likelihood of developing infection. Uh, and, uh, should, uh, and so you want to know that as you approach, whether you do a necrosectomy at the first time, uh, how many stents you place, or if you, you kind of can predict their course, if they develop infection, you're not surprised you can bring them back and do an additional uh, uh, debridement at that particular time. Uh, lastly, the other thing you want to appreciate is uh, the likelihood of bleeding because the, the risks are here are infection and bleeding. And so if this uh, patient has portal hypertension, uh, gastric varices, or uh, con you're concerned about a pseudoaneurysm, uh, uh, these are things that you want to appreciate. And generally, these are contraindications to proceeding with uh, endoscopic drainage. It's worth uh, mentioning. If you, it's worthwhile repeating a CT scan uh, bef just before you proceed because things can change with these pseudocysts. And it, 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 you want it to be contrast enhanced in terms of help appreciating the uh, vascular anatomy. So as far as uh, managing the pseudocysts themselves, the main indication uh, for drainage is the patient's symptoms. Uh, we know uh, through various uh, series that uh, uh, many of these uh, pseudocysts uh, uh, don't require any intervention at all if they're asymptomatic. There certainly was the old adage that if it was six centimeters at six weeks, then they needed uh, intervention. But there are many series that have been published since then that basically have elected to not intervene in the absence of symptoms and uh, follow these along, and, this, and many of these uh, will resolve. Now, the drainage options, uh, as I alluded to earlier, include open or uh, a laparoscopic surgery, uh, percutaneous drainage, as well as uh, what's increasingly being done as endoscopic or transluminal uh, drainage. There's no hey, question James? surgical drainage is still considered the hey, gold James? standard. Yep. Yeah, hey, if I can interrupt for a second, yep. this is Phil Shower. Yeah, this might be a good time to, um, to seek out uh, some opinions from uh, our audience. And I'd like to acknowledge our friends at Mount Sinai. I know that they have, uh, Mount Sinai in New York, that is, they have uh, a, a program going on this morning, Advances in Minimally Invasive Surgery. And we have Dan Heron and Barry Salke and Barry Navitt. And... Um, uh, Barry or, or Dan, uh, I see you guys in the audience. Uh, how would you guys, uh, how do you guys approach pancreatic uh, pseudocysts at your institution? Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, we, uh, I think the presentation this morning from Dr. Ellesmere actually shows um, a lot of the pertinent points um, on diagnos diagnosing and managing pseudocysts, but I think with that case that was presented, um, the, the management, I have some concerns with uh, the endoscopic approach, um, I think um, I'll, I'll just go right to that point. And looking at that management, um, a, a balloon dilatation to 15 millimeters, I would be concerned that's not quite enough drainage. And I also would be concerned about not um, doing a biopsy of the, uh, of, the, of the cyst wall or having the ability to, to really over sew that um, cyst wall when you do the opening, uh, because that certainly is likely to bleed. So. At our institution, the standard practice is a laparoscopic approach. Um, and these are some of the more gratifying things to present because these patients really do have uh, symptoms, often from just the mass effect of the cyst itself, particularly when they're, when they're quite large, when they're greater than six centimeters. And so the effects are quite immediate. These patients really feel better um, the, the day after the operation. And um, I think with a laparoscopic approach and an anterior gastrotomy, um, the recovery is, uh, is fairly quick. I'll, I'm going to pass the microphone to Dan Jones. He and, has and Barry, as you do that, uh, it sounds like you're not a fan of this endoscopic approach. Are there situations where you think that that might be appropriate, a purely endoscopic, minimally invasive approach? Well, yeah, I think sometimes if you have a cyst in the head of the pancreas and perhaps the cyst gastrostomy is not feasible and you have to do it maybe into the small bowel, I think attempting an endoscopic approach is certainly a good first option if you have a competent interventionalist a gastroenterologist. However, I would also advocate putting in pigtail drains, and they often have to stay in for several months. So um, what we do is we, we drain them, we put in these pigtail drains, and then patients follow with sequential um, imaging 
and often you will see some resolution over um, this interval of time and then you go back and, and you remove those drains um, later. But I think you have to, just with a 15 miller, millimeter balloon dilatation, you're not going to get adequate drainage and you're likely to have a recurrence without something in there like a pigtail drain. Dr. Jones? I think he's passing me the phone because we've already talked and whispered and said we like the laparoscopic approach, especially for a large pseudocyst adhering to the posterior wall of the stomach. Um, you know, but we may not see it. I mean, Jim's going to get to these simple cysts first. He's going to drain them this way, and we may not have these walking in our office anymore. And how about the ability to do an adequate uh, biopsy? Is that necessary, Barry, uh, on these? What's, what is the risk of malignancy? Isn't it so low that it probably doesn't matter? Well, that's a good question. I think um, with, with cross-sectional imaging being as high quality as it is nowadays, we, we often, when combining these images with um, a good detailed history, um, you can often arrive at a diagnosis, this is a pseudocyst as opposed to a mucinous cystadenoma or carcinoma, for example. And in addition, if you do an endoscopic biopsy, you can send the fluid and sometimes that will provide some guidance on a neoplastic process versus a, a true pseudocyst. Um, in addition, if you look at that pancreas from that image uh, that was shown earlier, it was just riddled with calcification, and that's clearly um, a, a pseudocyst. That's a pancreas that's been deranged and uh, has undergone a pseudocyst formation. So you use all that information together to arrive um, at, uh, at, a, at, a, at a diagnosis. However, um, I think the gold standard is to get tissue and to do a biopsy. And um, so... That, that's it. Well, let's go back to uh, Dr. Ellesmere uh, to respond to that. Uh, James, so an abnet is saying uh, that's a cool approach, but you, you can't get a biopsy and, and drainage is poor. So what do you think? Well, as far as the, the, the drainage issue, you know, that we'll present the data as we go along with the, the resolution rate with uh, endoscopic drainage is, is excellent. And so uh, that's a, that's a, and whether you approach that with a 15 millimeter or, or two centimeter dilatation, uh, there's, there's no data to say you know one is particularly better than the other. What's what's clear in all these is that you need a clinician to look after these patients and follow them along and and uh, and, and address any issues that uh, resolve. But I mean, there's many many series out there with uh, uh, success rates in terms of resolution on the order of 90 percent with endoscopic drainage. So, and what about the issue uh, of biopsy? As far as the uh, as a need for uh, uh, biopsy, um, uh, you know, that's, again, there's, there's local practice patterns, but uh, uh, most uh, pancreatic cystic lesions uh, today uh, can be adequately diagnosed with a uh, combination of CT and MR, and if there's any doubt, then uh, adding in a EUS and a, and a, uh, and a, and a biopsy is, is, is a reasonable approach. Um, I, I don't think, uh, as far as a uh, Therapy point of view, we need to be combining the, uh, the, uh, the the diagnostic process with the therapy in 2011. But okay. uh, so should we should we continue or? Yeah, yeah. Tell us what you have. Show us some data. So so, so that's right. You know, it's all been no no data yet. So as far as uh, uh, surgical drainage, I, I I would but you know I certainly frame that it is surgical drainage is considered uh, the gold standard. And I wouldn't I wouldn't debate that. If you look at the series. The morbidity rates and the mortality rates tend to be a little bit higher than the endoscopic approach, and that's what's that's what's happened in a lot of centers. So now, what you see is, and not every center, many centers have have uh, approached these endoscopically, and then what happens is, should they fail endoscopic uh, therapy, then they then they move on to uh, a surgical uh, uh, intervention. As far as uh, percutaneous uh, percutaneous drainage, I think what we've seen over the last decade is that it's it's kind of not quite as popular as it, uh, as it once was. And I think the issue is, and we've all seen this, that you can lead to very uh, prolonged external drainage, uh, so a, a bag off the side for, for several months. Uh, and then, of course, that uh, drain comes out, and then you could end up with an, uh, uh, an external fistula, or uh, probably even worse than that, uh, is a reaccumulation of your uh, pseudocyst. And, but there's no question that many times a percutaneous is adequate, and the feeling is that that's some patients have a normal pancreatic duct and those who have strictures in their pancreatic duct but no communication between the duct and itself and the cyst itself. And so generally, um, the feeling is it's not recommended for patients who have pancreatic duct strictures and communication between the cyst and the duct or if there's a complete cutoff of the duct itself. 
As far as transluminal drainage, I think it's important to put it in its uh, historical context. Um, uh, as surgeons, we've certainly used transluminal drainage uh, for, for some time with pelvic septus. I know uh, certainly in our institution, uh, transrectal, uh, uh, transanal uh, is oftentimes used uh, by the interventional radiologists for uh, pelvic sepsis quite effectively. Uh, now we know with biliary sepsis, the history of biliary sepsis was a surgical condition, but with uh, technology that emerged, which is primarily the duodenoscope as well as the fluoroscopy and the evolution of techniques that biliary sepsis today is almost exclusively uh, managed by uh, therapeutic endoscopists. And sinus surgery is another prime example where this is uh, something that's treated, uh, um, you know, with endoscopic uh, techniques and increasingly that's using advances in uh, surgical navigation to increase the efficacy of that. And so I think you can see the, the, uh, uh, the evolution of uh, transluminal uh, sepsis management. And I think it's also important to put that managing pancreatic uh, pseudocysts in the context of pancreatic endotherapy. Endoscopy is used to routinely treat pan pancreatic duct stone strictures and fistulas in addition to the pseudocysts. And we've, there's been a long track record here and endoscopic therapy is safe, feasible, and effective. There's no question the results are operator dependent and the feeling is for pancreatic endotherapy specifically, above and beyond just kind of routine ERCP, this should be done at high volume uh, centers with uh, high volume endoscopists. But there's no question there is some a fair criticism because many of the studies uh, that, uh, that show benefit are, are not particularly uh, well designed. And that's, but that's, some of that's just the nature of the disease. We all know with pancreatic pseudocysts, there's, there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity within those, that patient population. Uh, and uh, the other criticism has been the follow-up. But we'll talk about some of the, the data that's out there. As far as the endoscopic approach, there's transmural and transpapillary. The case that I showed earlier was the uh, cyst gastrostomy. It's important to recognize it's also a cyst duodenoscopy. Um, as far as when you'd use the transmural versus transpapillary, if this person has a big pseudocyst or there's a question of infection with uh, necrotic de debris, most of us would approach that transmurally because there's, you, want, you can get a bigger hole and you can access the, uh, the space and deal with that infection. Uh, Transpapillary is generally reserved, as mentioned earlier, for the cysts that tend to be in the head and, and tend to be the, uh, the smaller cysts. Um, as far as the data, one of the uh, uh, Devere's group in, in Belgium, this is a, a series that's often uh, referenced in gastrointestinal endoscopy 2006, 116 consecutive patients, endoscopic, transpapillary, transgastric, as well as duodenal, so kind of a grab bag. Follow-up was uh, 21 months, and they showed a complete resolution, 87%. That number shows up again. That reflects our experience as well as reflects many of the series that are out there. And that was the same both for the acute pancreatitis pseudocyst uh, as well as the ones that developed in the setting of chronic pancreatitis. There was one procedure related to death uh, in that series. Now, uh, when, when would you might consider uh, transduodenal cyst drainage? This uh, shows you a... Um, uh, uh, on the, the left image shows you a filling of the, uh, of the bile duct. You see there's some gross dilatation in the uh, lower third of the, uh, the bile duct. You can see there's a narrowing, uh, and that uh, corresponds to the pseudocyst. You can see on this image here where you have the, the pancreatic duct, and there is no communication uh, in this particular case between the, uh, the pancreatic duct uh, and the cyst. However, on the uh, CT scan, you know where the cyst exists, and you can see that there's a bulge here. So again, that's reasonable to go ahead and use a similar technique as shown earlier and put a guide wire. I think if you look over here, it's important to see uh, some of the techniques involved here, where you see the guide wire goes into the pseudocyst and it's coiled. That coiling is very, very important. That provides your stability now so that you can run your devices over that wire. You can see here the stent in the, uh, in the bile duct itself. And here at the end, you see the stent uh, placed uh, transduodenally. Here's the uh, stent in the bile duct, and again, stent in the bile duct and the uh, stent in the cyst. As far as uh, transpapillary, um, here's an image showing the bile duct. Again, you see this dilated bile duct. We know that you can get biliary obstruction uh, from pseudocysts. And here's the, the, uh, the, uh, the guide wire going up the, uh, the bile duct here. And there's a guide wire in the, in the pancreatic duct. Uh, the next image here shows you that guide wire in the pancreatic duct now starting to coil in the pseudocyst. You can start to see some contrast in that pseudocyst uh, as well. And so in this particular case, again, you see a, a stent placed in the bile duct and a stent, a single stent placed in the pseudocyst leading to uh, a subsequent resolution. As far as uh, 
uh, image guidance, there's, uh, there's no, uh, no question that uh, you need to have both endoscopy and fluoroscopy. That's always used. Now, that, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, technical variation, uh, not even surgery versus endoscopy, with, just within the en endoscopic uh, community. Some endoscopists uh, prefer to use a gastroscope, so an end viewing scope if they're doing transgastric work. Others will use a duodenoscope, scope, which is a side viewing scope. That's my preference. It has an elevator. I find it's helpful in terms of uh, controlling the situation. Uh, in terms of uh, image guidance, there's no question there's a clear role, particularly in cases where the endoscopic appearance is inadequate. So you get down there, you can't really appreciate that nice bulge that I showed earlier. Um, and there's emerging evidence uh, that supports routine imaging. However, there's many who, uh, who use it selectively and have very good results uh, as well. Um, many centers that do use imaging, in addition to endoscopy and fluoroscopy, use EUS for guidance. Uh, but there are several series out there with transabdominal ultrasound as well as uh, CT guidance. In fact, I, we use a fair amount of CT guidance here at, at our particular center. But the, here's a very nice uh, uh, randomized control trial published in DOSB 2009 by the Korean group Prospective. Prospectively randomized 60 patients, uh, EUS guided versus the conventional endoscopic in terms of the access. So the technical success in the endoscopic was 94% versus in the endo is 72%, so there was an advantage. This is an intention to treat analysis. So what happened is the endo that failed crossed over into the EUS arm, and there was eight of those, and though all eight were successfully managed with the EUS guidance. The complications between the EUS and the endo were uh, this, essentially the same, seven and 10%, short-term resolution. And here are the numbers again that you see uh, recurrent uh, over and over again, which is 97% with EUS and 91% with endo and long-term resolution being on the 89% and 86% with uh, endo. It's worth uh, reinforcing the, the concepts of the, uh, the contraindications. If you think this is a neoplastic process, portal hypertension, gastric varicy, sooner aneurysm, and as the other, other issue is this person has a coagulopathy that you can't reverse, or if there's no clear endoscopic window, then you don't want to approach this uh, endoscopically. Uh, however, in my experience, most of these uh, can be approached uh, uh, endoscopically. As far as the uh, managing the complications, uh, it's essentially a surgery, and as you would expect, the complications are both uh, bleeding and uh, infection. Uh, as far as bleeding, many times, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, the concern is from the, the wall. Um, Almost always, you just need to dilate, and there's, uh, and there's, and you, you don't need to do any additional uh, intervention than that. The, the bleeding just uh, stops. However, bleeding does occur, uh, and should it occur, it's almost always just effectively managed endoscopically. The techniques are your standard techniques: injection of epinephrine. You can use a heater probe. You can use clips um, uh, for that bleeding. Now, if you have bleeding from inside the cyst, of course, you know things like sidewall or uh, 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 pseudoaneurysms and stuff. Um, most people would approach that uh, surgically or, or uh, with uh, angiography. Infection is an important issue to appreciate as well because it's, it's something that's important to consider when you interpret the literature and failure rates. Many of the earlier series was if they developed an infection, uh, then that was considered a failure and they were moved on for surgery. But what we've seen emerge over the last five years in the literature is being more aggressive in terms of treating the infection uh, endoscopically, and, and really the, the context of that technique is the endoscopic necrosectomy. And so again, the same sort of pseudocyst where you do your gastrotomy and the guide wire is placed and you coil your guide wire, uh, but you follow that uh, guide wire using a, a balloon right into the uh, pseudocyst itself. And that's exactly the same technique that we were all doing uh, uh, when we were approaching, uh, you know, how to access the abdomen transgastrically for, for notes. Um, and so once you're in that pseudocyst, this is a sort of appearance that you have, that you have this uh, thick uh, mucousy uh, stuff. And, and what, oftentimes this is what leads to uh, uh, loculations or um, blockages of your stents. And so uh, there's uh, many, many uh, series out there that you can approach these using different techniques in the literature. Some people advocate using a water jet. Uh, in fact, there's devices that are designed specifically for that, so you can uh, kind of jet clean off uh, the area. Uh, my practice, I tend to use uh, just a gentle debridement uh, with a um, with a basket, uh, and I would uh, and you can different degrees of uh, degrees of debridement. Uh, in my experience, you don't need to de debride uh, quite this much, but uh, others do advocate uh, uh, for for that. 
And again, at the end, it's a, uh, certainly in the setting of infection, you want to put in uh, several uh, stents uh, to uh, promote uh, drainage. Uh, the last uh, point was the uh, issue of removing stents that was brought up earlier. It's an interesting point. And again, a lot of these things are in, in evolution. Certainly the, the standard practice uh, for many years was uh, once the cyst uh, resolved, uh, and usually a CT scan was done um, uh, six to eight weeks post-procedure, then you consider bringing them back for stent removal. And that's uh, kind of the mainstay of practice for many uh, people doing uh, endoscopic uh, uh, drainage. However, again, DeVere's group uh, published in Gastrointestinal Endoscopy 2007, small study uh, with about uh, randomized 30 patients, but uh, basically the randomization was uh, leave the stents in indefinitely in the pseudocyst versus take them out. And they showed that the success rate was significantly uh, better in terms of long-term resolution with uh, just leaving the, the stents in uh, themselves. Uh, so that's um, I had some people question their practice. But this is, this is, a, this is a, something that's in, in evolution uh, currently, and the answer remains to be known entirely. So uh, in summary, uh, it's important to uh, critically review the history uh, and imaging at the time of the uh, of, the, of the diagnosis. Uh, uh, most symptomatic cysts can be drained effectively using endoscopic and image guidance techniques. I think that's, I think that's clear based on the, uh, the literature. Uh, complications can occur, and oftentimes the complications themselves uh, can be treated endoscopically. Uh, and, and again, this entirely varies from center to center, but it's, uh, our practice here is surgery has generally been reserved for uh, uh, failed uh, endoscopic management. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dr. Elsman, thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent presentation, and it's pretty impressive that uh, you're able to manage the majority of these endoscopically. That's certainly uh, about the um, most minimally invasive approach that there is. It's effective. Um, we're going to open up uh, for questions. So for all of you at um, the various sites, please feel free uh, to call in. The phone number is right there if you have any questions or comments. I do want to go to some specific sites and uh, get their impression um, of how they manage these pseudocysts at their institution. Let's first go to uh, Carolina's Medical Center um, in North Carolina. I understand uh, Dr. Rick Green is there with his group. Um, good morning, Rick. How are you? Hi, Phil. How are you? And that was a great presentation. Uh, Dave Ionetti, our chief of HPB, has a question, and I'd like uh, to uh, just introduce David. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everybody. I want to congratulate my friends up in Nova Scotia for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I have a couple of comments. One is that I think that, you know, nowadays with modern technology, you know, we have the ability to drain some of these small and medium-sized pseudocysts with endoscopic minimally invasive techniques, I think, is a huge advantage to the patients. But certainly there's been a huge evolution in the management uh, from a surgical point of view as well. And I sort of agree a little bit with uh, Dr. Heron at Mount Sinai. And I want to say hi to Dan Jones, and I'm getting my fuse questions done today. But the, I think that when you start dealing with more complicated cysts, larger cysts, uh, particularly the ones we deal with on the hepatobiliary surgical service, there seems to be a higher incidence of internal septations and lots of necrosis and whatnot. And we also take a little bit more of a, an aggressive surgical approach, a little bit different than the traditional laparoscopic approach. We tend to do what's called a laparoscopic endoscopic transgastric cyst gastrostomy. That's a mouthful. <laughs> so our general approach to these larger pseudocysts, particularly those with a large amount of necrosis, old blood, what have you, uh, would be to first place an endoscope and insufflate the stomach. And then we'll place uh, laparoscopic trocars into the abdomen. We'll place an umbilical port. <clears throat> and then we'll actually place uh, laparoscopic trocars directly into the gastric lumen. So we'll put a 10 millimeter port for a stapler um, in the midline, so that's going into the antrum. And usually two 5 millimeter ports as far peripheral as you can get on the greater curvature of the stomach, just above the gastroepiploic arcade, usually the balloon ports, so that you can pull the stomach out and out, you know, down and out. And then we'll use intraoperative ultrasound to uh, map out the uh, pseudocyst, usually the ones we deal with, it's not usually a surprise where they are, you know, used with a large bulge. 
But laparoscopic ultrasound also can be very helpful in terms of identifying where the major vessels are so you can pick just the right spot to make your cystgastrostomy. And then once we open uh, through the gastric lumen, usually uh, either with a harmonic scalpel or an energy device, and we enter the lumen, we'll confirm with ultrasound again, and then we'll use uh, laparoscopic uh, linear cutters to uh, create a, you know, an anastomosis that might be five, six, seven centimeters long. So it really opens up the posterior wall of the stomach. And then now that you have a laparoscope and graspers and suction irrigators and whatnot, then we'll go ahead and completely debris out the cyst cavity so that there's no residual necrosis or fibrin on the walls. And then to finish, we'll uh, often take the extra step of maturing that posterior cyst gastrostomy by uh, putting a series of, say, horizontal mat or um, figure of aided either 2O or zero vicral sutures around the anastomosis to decrease the incidence of staple line bleeding as well. Then we'll pull out, go back laparoscopically, and close the gastric holes with a couple of uh, interrupted sutures. We've found this to be a fairly effective uh, and a nice minimally invasive way of dealing with a larger, more complicated pseudocyst and something for everyone to consider. <clears throat> yeah, so is the advantage of that approach, you're just going to get uh, better long-term control and drainage as opposed to an endoscopic because you can create such a wide um, stoma? Right, we think so. I think that, the uh, again, the small to moderate-sized pseudocysts that are unilocular with not a lot of necrosis, I think an endoscopic approach is a great approach, uh, at least to start. Again, what we deal with on the hepatobiliary services are the 10, 12, 15 centimeter that have bled into them with large amounts of pancreatic necrosis or peripancreatic necrosis, and much more complicated. And we definitely feel that we can do a much more adequate job of providing better drainage and debridement uh, at the time of the intervention. <clears throat> so I have a question for Dr. Elsmere while I, while I have you. Uh, there's been a couple of papers recently on using endoscopic ultrasound for pain control, especially in these patients with pancreatic, uh, chronic pancreatitis. I was wondering why he's doing the endoscopic approaches. Is he injecting the celiac plexus? Has he considered to do that? And what is his use of uh, EUS for pain control? Dr. Elsmere, did you hear that question from Dr. Green? Yeah, I, I did. I think I think it's I think it's an excellent question, and uh, the uh, you know pain control in this we, the conversation the most of the discussion was uh, limited to uh, pseudocysts, and as you know, pseudocysts occur both in the chronic pancreatitis setting as well as in the acute setting, which uh, aren't necessarily uh, chronic. And so, all, so you know, the management of chronic pancreatitis again is is another uh, whole. Uh, a conversation uh, in, it, in itself, so, uh, but it's clear that I, I mean not everyone that needs a cyst drain uh, is uh, has pain. So I, I actually I, I would separate those two issues. I separate those two issues clinically. Uh, I would I would deal with the uh, the uh, the pseudocyst uh, issue, and then uh, deal with the, uh, the 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 issue of chronic pancreatitis. In terms of doing a, a celiac uh, block. Um, uh, endoscopically, what um, it's not something that I do as part of my practice. I, do, I actually don't do uh, uh, endoscopic ultrasound, but I uh, in in our center here, a lot of this is managed uh, by a, a dedicated uh, chronic pain group that uses various interventional techniques. Uh, but uh, certainly, I, I know of uh, people that approach that with with EUS. Now, EUS gives you a fantastic uh, visualization of the celiac axis and. As far as uh, seeing it, it's actually it's easier. To, it's better to see it with the U.S. than it is even you know uh, identifying it operatively. Uh, well, short of extensive dissection, but you can you can uh, you can lay in your blocks on either side of the, uh, the celiac axis. And what's oftentimes that's done is they'll put a temporary block in, see what the uh, see what the results are like, and then consider doing a uh, an ablative procedure, a subsequent procedure. And I I think that's I think that's a, an excellent approach. Uh, and again, I think my op the the opening thought was there's a tremendous amount of variability in how a lot of these conditions as are approached, and it's a, it is a function of uh, the services that are uh, available uh, at uh, your local center. Well, great. And I want to get some more comments, and in just a minute, we're going to go to uh, Virginia Commonwealth and hear from Dr. Maher, and to Hopkins, and hear from uh, Mike Moran. But um, you know, uh, related to the um, the aforementioned laparoscopic approach, do you have any comments about the uh, laparoscopic approach? And in other situations, you know, I think you alluded to earlier, 
that a purely endoscopic approach might not be appropriate. And so in that setting, what would you do and what do you think about um, the laparoscopic approach that was described? I, I, again, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, a regional, uh, it's a regional approach. Uh, a lot of techniques have evolved uh, based on uh, local uh, expertise and comfort and interest in managing particular uh, uh, conditions, and the results uh, uh, can be excellent. I think, I think, that, I think that approach sounds uh, perfectly reasonable. Um, uh, you know, I, the, again, a lot of these big cysts can be approached, uh, uh, up front, uh, endoscopically, um, uh, recognizing there, there, there could be a failure associated with that, but you'd be surprised many of the times that we've successfully managed those endoscopically and avoid, uh, any, uh, you know, incisions at all. Um, and so I, I, I generally adopt an approach that if you can approach endoscopically, take care of it, that's reasonable. And if should failure occur, uh, then it's, I think, a, a operative approach is, uh, is, is the way to go. However, there are others that want a more aggressive, uh, rec recommend a more aggressive approach up front. And I, I think, again, that's, that's, that's not unreasonable. There's pros and cons for both. So it sounds like you approach all these up front endoscopically, and then you use surgery as your plan B if they, uh, the endoscopic approach is, does not uh, work, correct? That, that, that's, cor that's correct, yeah. Great. Well, let's go to um, Medical College of